Hi everyone, Kelsey Toner here from Be A Better Guide with another special guest. Today we're speaking with Tong Ho uh, from xotours.bn and we're going to learn a little bit about how Tong has moved from the United States back to Vietnam and has built up an incredibly successful tour and activity business. So um, his, his name is spelled T-U-N-G and we might want to say Tong in the United States. He says his American friends call him Tong, but in Vietnam, how is it pronounced? It's pronounced Tom. Tom. Okay, Tom. well, I'll do my best. Like Tom. Tom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join us and, and sharing any advice you're going to have for uh, other tour and activity operators out there looking to grow and scale up. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let, we'll just start with uh, just a brief overview of uh, a little bit of background on your story, how you got started, and the type of tours you lead. Okay, um, I. Uh, was born in Vietnam actually in 72, but my family escaped uh, to the U.S. at the end of the Vietnam War. We actually left one day before the fall of Saigon on April 29th. Wow. So uh, I lived in the U.S. since I was three, so I'm much more American than I am Vietnamese. Um, I uh, didn't come back to Vietnam until uh, end of 2009, and I started Exo Tours almost exactly one year later at the end of 2010, so about 2011. We're, our business has grown a lot. We started with three um, tour guides, and now we have uh, almost 140, 140 staff or so, um, with about uh, 80, 80 something tour guides. And um, our tours are unique in that we run tours by motorbike, you know, all around Ho Chi Minh City, and um, and all our drivers or our tour guides are female. So they're mm -hmm. female. They're wearing traditional dress, the same kind of dress you see on like, you know, all the Vietnam movies. And uh, they take uh, our guests around the city to go sightseeing and on uh, to eat around the city on our food tour. Um, so our food tour is ranked really highly, it was actually named one of the top nine food tours in the world by Forbes last year. And um, that's our by far our most popular tour. And, uh, you know, we're doing great. We're still uh, growing every year. That's amazing. So, you say 2011. So you've been at about seven or eight years that you've been working at it. That's right. that's incredible uh, growth. Just to give folks a sense in terms of the number of approximate number of folks that you take on tour a year or approximate revenues uh, at your size right now. Oh, well, I don't want to get into specific with the revenues, but we do seven figures, and uh, we've been growing. You know, the first few years we were growing you know, 100%, but it slowed down because I got a little lazy uh, around my fourth year and complacent, but then uh, I kind of regained a little bit of focus uh, in a 2000, the end of 2016, and I kind of focused more on hiring and training uh, a staff. So we started growing, regrowing. I think last year we grew about uh, 30%. So um, um, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, well, you absolutely should be. Well, have to get into uh, your uh, this area when you got complacent. That'll be interesting uh, to talk a little <laughs> bit about because maybe maybe a lot of tour and activity operators are out there. You know, they're hungry for growth, but uh, okay. I think with that comes a lot of work, right? You've got to you got to put in the put in the effort. So let's. Everybody loves this question. How are you getting so many people onto your tours? And you you come at this in a unique way. You were mentioning that you you don't use a lot of. Um, online travel agents as a distribution channel, like buy a tour or get your right. guide or those. Well, how do you get folks on your tours? We we actually don't use, we don't partner with anybody. Um, we actually, we don't work with any hotels or tour companies also. Uh, we, we get a lot of calls and requests to work, but, you know, I just find it more, uh, <clears throat> less, less stressful to just be able in control of our destiny and not having to depend on other people. So we try to just grow organically. And of course, if we would have worked with some OTAs or hotels or stuff, I'm sure we would have grown even faster. But, you know, I'm pretty, like I said, I'm pretty happy with our growth. And, uh, and uh, I, I want to keep continuing focus uh, on growing, uh, you know, our business just by marketing online. And <clears throat> the reason, the way we find most of our guests in the past, like I said, the first few years um, was through TripAdvisor, but then I got really that we were just depending too much, uh, you know, on one, um, you know, our bookings on in uh, with one channel, 
so I started uh, learning more about online marketing and what I needed to do to uh, be independent. So around our so just, just year, to quickly started, clarify okay. there, those were um, TripAdvisor was your main source of traffic. So people would find your tours through there. They it was not the book now button, but they would just go direct to your website. Yeah, we we never we never worked with Viator. We never signed up uh, on there. They've contacted us a few times, but you know the thing is, you know I I the reason I tell people I don't work with them is uh, that they take away all your branding. So you everything that you invested in. You with your marketing and and building your website and building your brand. Once you work with Viator and people book tours to them, they don't even know who you are. You know, right. so you just become thing, another yeah. generic uh, tour company. So I don't think that's in our best interest. So I think we, you know, we just that's the reason why we just continue to invest more and more money on uh, SEO and uh, Facebook marketing. I consider using AdWords also, but. In the past, you know, I just looked at <laughs> just doing a little bit of research. It seemed a little bit more complicated than what I wanted to put time into. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we were just so growing so quickly, uh, organically. You, we would book out tours almost daily. So it didn't feel necessary for me to uh, to uh, to to you know work on AdWords also at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's dive this in because you're saying most of this traffic is coming organically. Um, TripAdvisor also recently stripped away the ability to link directly to your website, so you were very right. wise to diversify. Uh, you know those years back when you said, "Hey, if 80% of my traffic is coming through TripAdvisor, um, all it takes is a small change like they did, and then you can see that traffic." drop off. So uh, I think right. that's a great piece of advice there to anyone who sees, whether it's TripAdvisor or some other source, if most of your traffic is coming through there, uh, looking to diversify will make you a lot more uh, stable. With uh, TripAdvisor changing their algorithm and uh, taking away the contact information, it did affect us earlier this year. So I, I kind of regret being, like I said, complacent a few years ago and not working harder. I think we could have done much better with our SEO in the last few years and also if I would have continued with uh, pushing with the online marketing. Uh, but I think we're back on track now. And by the end of the year, I think our bookings will be back to what it was before uh, by the change uh, algorithms. Sure. So let's let's uh, dive deep. And I love getting into these details. When you if somebody is looking at pursuing an SEO strategy, <clears throat> search engine optimization, what advice would you have for them in terms of where to begin and where you've seen the best return? Uh, I think you definitely have to start a blog and um, like I was telling you earlier I think you know with with content it's so important especially when you, you're a tour company uh, you can provide very specific travel advice to people and people are all before they go on vacation even if they're not you know a lot of people say that uh, you know people plan like as the years go by as uh, as uh, you know m mobile devices become more um, people depend on them more to make last minute bookings um, that, you know, people wait until they're at the location before the book. But, you know, in terms of like travel advice, you know, what like what to buy when you're at the location, what to eat, it's just like that. I think people like to do a little bit of those kind of research before they go on their trip. And um, if you provide content that target like niche information um, and you rank really high for, highly for those, you can draw a lot of traffic to your website from people that probably never even knew about your uh, Ecto Tours is ranked number one or two uh, on Google for that. If you Google Vietnam Tailors, we're ranked number one or two uh, for that too. And we get a lot of traffic just from uh, you know a few blog posts because we rank really high for these keywords. So once people get on a blog post, they see our banner, they see the tours we advertise and stuff, they, they might go, oh, you know, what is that? That looks kind of cool. So they'll go over there and check out our tours and then, um, you know, maybe book then, or at least bookmark us to uh, to to save for later. And I think um, you know, just content in general, ranking high for SEO is such an important thing because it's SEO. Once you rank, you can stay. You know, you can have these high rankings for years, and it doesn't cost you anything extra month monthly. Whereas if you're doing Facebook marketing or AdWords, you know, you could be have to put out you know hundreds or thousands of dollars in marketing just to have you know, to, to, to have a significant effect on your bookings. Yeah. So how, how would you uh, recommend if folks are 
um, say, okay, I'm going to take this next step into writing a blog, getting some content, looking to rank for uh, not even just keywords, as you're saying, directly related to, oh, I don't know, let's say Toronto walking tours, um, but other topics that are related to Toronto. Or for those who didn't know, when, when you're saying, you know, um, Vietnam tailors, that's something that's specific to Vietnam, that a lot of tourists and visitors, when they come, they're interested in finding out more about the high quality right. tailors that are there that you can get bespoke and custom um, clothing made at a at an absolute bargain compared to anything you know certainly in Europe or, or North America um, right so, so I guess I'm just looking for more advice on what keywords you should target and how to know what you should write that content about I don't offer those things just because our blog posts uh gives a lot of uh, provides a lot of u unique information about those services uh, people land on our website from searching for these articles and the way i come up with topics like what to write i just go to the forum the travel forum so if you go you know you use lonely planet you can go to the lonely planet forum i personally go to the you know the trip advisor vietnam forums a lot so i see questions that people pose and and, and it's common question people ask all the time so you, you know just from the frequency of these questions, you know what a lot, a lot of travelers are about. So, you know, just write a Every time you see a question that commonly shows up, just write a list of what these questions are and then target these blog posts to answer those questions. I think that's fantastic. I had not heard that advice before. So there's probably um, Lonely Planet forums, all kind, any travel guide typically now has an online area. You're mentioning these TripAdvisor forums. I imagine yeah. even brainstorming a, with your guides groups. too. Right. So the, right. The, the questions that your visitors, people who are already on your tours, I'm sure they're asking your guides and your field staff these types of questions all the time would be another great so source. Right. You hear a common questions like, you know, currency, like what kind of currency you use, uh, you know, how to get a visa and stuff like that. So we have a really, you know, popular visa blog. We have uh, a blog post on uh, creating itineraries, you know, for Vietnam, because Vietnam's a very long country and there's so many diverse things that you can do so people are you know are worried about that uh, they're worried about visas you know how to get into the countries and which countries need visas which countries don't uh, so these are just common things are that you know that you could easily help out travelers by uh, writing good content and when you write content it's just not you know a lot of people write content just to write content they think that's enough it's not enough um, Google says that you need to write at least, I think, a thousand words for, for you know a, a blog post to have a significant effect, or you know, uh, or, or rank highly. Um, also, you if you're, um, I suggest if you're using, you have a website or a blog that you use WordPress. WordPress has you know a lot of free plugins for uh, that helps with SEO. The one that we use is called Yoast, and it's a free plugin. And you know, when you write the article at the end, it'll do an, it'll analyze your article and it'll tell you, it'll ask you what keyword you're trying to rank for, or you're trying to, you know, what, what is the main keyword that you're using in this article. And then it'll, it'll analyze your article based on that keyword to see, you know, what you should do. Do you have a good content and you optimize the SEO for that article? You have to share it. You have to share it to your uh, Facebook, uh, you know, on social media. You have to get people to read it. You have to people to like it. You have to be able to share it because Google knows that if people are reading, if, you know, once they get on the article, how long they're spending on that article, if they're sharing it with their friends and family and stuff like that. If you read, if you write really bad content that nobody reads, nobody cares, nobody clicks on, it's not going to rank. Yeah. Well, I loved, too, that your advice is pretty down to earth. You know, you can, I, and I recommend doing some basic searching on keyword research. You just type that into Google and there are some tools that can uh, will pop up and look for simple straightforward ones. You know, you're not doing advanced SEO for a big company like Expedia. Just try and get some down to earth uh, tips because even something as simple as the um, Google autocomplete, you know, when you start typing a sentence into Google, mm -hmm. it'll have suggestions and those suggestions aren't just uh, made up. They're based on the search volume for these particular words. So um, that is just right. another way that you could um, find some areas, some, some keywords to target. And Yoast is a great plugin for WordPress, and it gives you some of these other guidelines. Like you only want to be targeting one keyword or one topic 
to say right. per page. So that's a common mistake too. If you don't want to have a blog post that maybe is talking about how to, um, you know, information on Vietnam tailors, and then the second half is going to focus on uh, massage, and the third one maybe focused on this. You right, want to right, separate right. those out, and each particular post is going to. Um, your goal is to have it rank for particular keywords. Um, but it, mm -hmm. but again, don't let the keyword thing throw you off. Basically, just like Tom has said, it's questions that travelers have. And I saw a great example of, um, it was a, a pool company, you know, any business can do this, but it was a, a company that sells pools here in uh, Ontario, in Canada. And they had this uh, epic blog where essentially all they were doing was, it was like, you know how you have frequently asked questions maybe on your website. It was almost like they took each one of right. those and wrote, just like you say, about a thousand word blog posts and tried to be as helpful as possible. So a question might be, do you want an above ground pool or an in ground pool? What are the pros and cons of these two types of pools? Because this is one of the most common questions they get as a business that sells pools. Um, then they have a detailed guide. Hey, here are your pros. Here are the cons. Here are some things to, to think about. And they rank really well for all of the questions that relate to somebody who might be considering a pool or researching it. And so um, they're just trying to be helpful to the customers. And that creates great um, right. exposure because obviously they're going to see your brand. They can see that you also offer those services. Um, but it's also a great uh, touch point. Your first <laughs> touch point with your customer is not trying to sell them a tour. It's being helpful. Right. But at the end of each article, you can also mention, you know, your services and link back powerful links that link back to your website is one of the most important strategies of uh, SEO. Yeah. So did you at some point hire an SEO specialist or a team or when did you make that decision if you did? Um, I did uh, the second year because I knew nothing about SEO and I thought it was just, you know, from talking to the, the specialist uh, that, you know, he told me it was all about links. So he was trying to uh, buy, get a lot of paid links, you know, and he would get in, he would, he, he had a bunch of existing pages like for dentistry or whatnot and linking it to my page. And he promised me that within six months that I would be ranking number one for all the key terms that, you know, that I wanted, which obviously never happened and it wasn't even close. So, you know, I, um, I fired him pretty quickly and then I was frustrated. I threw away you know, like $9,000 or something in six months. So that's when I started learning about SEO myself. And I figured it actually wasn't as difficult uh, as it seemed. Um, right now, I am working with another uh, SEO specialist and he's helping me clean up my blog and my website because over the years, like I said, I got complacent and I didn't really uh, optimize a lot of things. So he's helping me with that right now. But I think I know enough right now to know what I should do and what to focus on and what not to do. Mm -hmm. So it, and, uh, what would, if you had to go back and do it again, what advice would you give somebody who's, who's just starting out on that SEO journey? Would you then recommend learning a little bit yourself and then starting there? Or um, I, I think that if somebody's starting out, just don't even think about SEO. Just think about content. Think about writing really, really good content that's really helpful, that's unique. Don't write content that's you can find like similar content, like you know the, the Me Too content that everybody else writes or other tour companies write. You're not going to rank very well for that uh, if you're going to write you know generic stuff. If you, you write that's helpful and people are sharing and reading it, I think you'll automatically rank for a lot of without even focusing on SEO. Um, I have a friend uh, in Vietnam. He writes a blog called Vietnam Coracle, and he does no SEO at all, but he ranks tremendously very high for a lot of key terms because he writes he's a prolific writer he writes you know you know two uh, blog posts every week and he writes really long really good really unique content that nobody else writes yeah that's great advice too that uh, you can get certainly if you have conversations with specialists and I, I've been burned by this myself and uh, you know people who come in and make all kinds of promises and try and make things right. seem a lot more complex I think that's good uh, frame of mind. And I think Google recognized this too, that, you know, at some point they, the kind of, how do you say that maybe the cart got in front of the horse where people were, you know, stuffing their pages with keywords. It became about ranking versus, right. which is the original mission of Google, which is to connect people with the most useful and accurate information 
possible. And so you don't, that's a, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think um, starting with the blog posts and the content, uh, and there, again, it's not, not the generic stuff, but things that are going to be helpful to your customers. So if you have a particular niche, then you can niche that content down. So if you only serve, you know, people over, you know, 60 years old, for example, that's really your target market, maybe you're a luxury end or baby boomer type tour or product, then those questions can be specific to that niche um, as well, because then you're ranking um, for those terms that people are going to be, be searching for. So be helpful to your ideal customer avatar, if you've heard that before, but right. basically there. And, and again, if you have multiple types of tours, you can have multiple um, types of content. So, um, okay, so you heard it here first. Start with content. And if you, and if you don't have time to write those great um, articles, you can certainly hire some help doing that, I would imagine. In total, we have 50-something blog posts on our website, and that's over seven and a half years. So, it's what, you know, some years I only have like three, four blog posts, but they're really good blog posts, and they write, you know, and we update them. So, sometimes it's actually better to update an old blog post with better content and optimize it rather than write new content that's not as good. So, you know, so don't be intimidated if you don't have time to write a ton of content, but if you write content just write a few that are really, really good, that, you know, really unique that you can't find anywhere else. Yeah. And I don't hesitate to link out to other resources, I think is great um, advice too. So within there, um, obviously your big call to action at the end might be, hey, check out our tours or, or we do this, right. but, but putting some links, you know, if you mention um, a resource or another company, it's okay to put those links in there because Google sees that as um, um something that they want to reward like you're being helpful to somebody yeah. by, you're mentioning something and you're providing a direct link to the thing you're mentioning um they they reward you for that so uh, something to keep in mind as well right okay so so seo um became a big push how to be thinking back you know was there a period of time before that you really started to see traffic from that and and how do you measure that stuff so do you use Google Analytics, or how, how do you know your sort of return on investment? Uh, I did. We, we used Google Analytics, and I saw traffic growing. You know, our traffic grew thousands of percent after just a, a, a few months of writing good content. But the thing is, with Google Analytics, I think it's, it's, it, you know, if you use it for the first time, it seems overwhelming. There's so many settings and features and, and things like that. And, you know, and I, I just didn't have time you know, with running not just exit tours, but I have multiple other businesses that I run that choose to analyze every little, um, you know, uh, data, every single data through Google Analytics. So I just focus on writing good content, optimizing, you know, the SEO on our website and on our blog. And, um, and uh, I do a little bit of Facebook marketing too, um, which I started about three or four years ago. And uh, I think the Facebook marketing has, uh, has helped a lot also. Yeah, so let's let's dive in dive into that. Did you embrace both the paid strategy and the sort of organic Facebook traffic? How did you approach that decision? Um, well, the Facebook originally uh, the organic traffic, you know, helped us a lot. Uh, we have like right now, I think we have thirteen thousand uh, followers or uh, followers on our Facebook page, and whenever I have a new um, blog content, I'll post. I'll, I'll uh, share it on there, and it gets a lot of interaction, a lot of shares from Facebook, which helps the SEO uh, on our website. Um, I started uh, doing paid um, advertisement also about three years ago, and I actually spend very, very little on paid advertising. People would be shocked how little I do. Um, I think I only spend about five dollars a day, so it's uh, in the month. You know, I spend uh, about one hundred and fifty dollars, um, and I target. You know, customers just based on like the history of uh, the type of customer that book our tours. I would target those countries. I would target uh, people that are traveling at the time, people that are interested in Vietnam, Vietnamese food, uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh City and stuff like that. Uh, so I started, you know, three years ago to start paying about five dollars a month, like I said. But you know, I I never really optimized my targeting until uh, the last. Um, year and I noticed a big difference. Um, the cost, I think cost per, let me see, what, what do they call it? Um, cost per impression um, at the, in the early days, you know, it was so cheap. I think it costs, um, 
me less than five cents uh, to get one impression. Uh, but then over time, I think it rose up to 57, 56, 57 cents uh, per, per impression. But uh, once I figured out how to optimize my audience, now it's back down to 13 cents per impression. And I think we're getting a lot more interaction from those guests because I'm targeting my actual core audience rather than a general, um, you know, I was going to say, let's, from, let's from dive, dive deep into there. So when you say optimizing target, um, target audience there, you're kind of going, providing more details so that Facebook is going to show the ad to fewer people overall and ideally the people that you're trying to get on your tour. Is that the idea? Right. My, my, my audience before I would name my audience uh, on Facebook, I always call it them prime customers. And at the time, my prime customers were 52 million people. But I was targeting the entire country of the U.S., uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the U.K., Singapore. Um, so that's a lot of people in there. So I thought at the time that, you know, the bigger the audience would be that the larger exposure that more people would, you know, find my website and get exposed to my tours. But, you know, I was like I said, the, the price per impression kept on rising. So I knew that wasn't the case. So I I decided to optimize my audience even more because I know like from the U.S., most of my customers come from New York and Los Angeles. So I started just targeting. I made a list of the 100, or actually I didn't make a list, but I Googled uh, the 100 most populous uh, cities in the world. Then I targeted only the English speaking countries. And then I, I made that my audience. So for the US, my audience was like Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Dallas, Houston. And um, for UK was London and Manchester and Australia was uh, you know, uh, Melbourne and uh, Sydney. Uh, so, you know, and so my audience actually shrunk, audience size shrunk down to 3,600,000. But then I started getting a lot more interaction from those 3,600,000 than I did with the 52 million. And that, just to clarify that 3 million there, is that including additional characteristics? Like, did you have demographic yes, information like, like age? Uh, I limited the age to 25 to 50, I believe, and you know, and I still targeted guests that were traveling and was interested in Vietnam, Vietnamese food, adventure travel, and you know, I I also never targeted anybody in Vietnam, so I actually didn't target the country I'm actually in. I just targeted all the audience outside, you know, my prime audience that were outside of uh, Vietnam. Yeah, well, well, thanks so much for sharing some of these details because I think many others who might be in that same decision, the same point where they haven't decided whether to pursue Facebook advertising. It seems overwhelming. Surely there's no way that you could just figure this out. I think you're at the same uh, point as with your SEO. It's like you can take some steps to learn a bit about it yourself and you don't need a ton of knowledge to be able to um, make some pretty effective campaigns. And like Tom was saying, you don't need to spend a lot early on. And what's great about the Facebook advertising is you can very quickly get a sense on of your return on investment. Um, that might require some additional steps to sort of be able to let Facebook know that you're converting. But again, out if you do some basic research, just like we talked about with keyword research, how to write great uh, blog posts with SEO, there are guides out there that are for free on the internet that can walk you through how to create an effective um, Facebook campaign and maybe even Facebook campaigns for tour companies. You know, there's, 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 I know of a few uh, booking software companies that have workshops, that have uh, guides that you can print out. And it doesn't need to be um, too complicated. As you saw here, Tom right. just listed, I know this is where most of my com customers come from. This is their approximate age. Uh, all you're doing there is telling Facebook who your ideal customers are. Their interests, I think, are, are a huge one there in terms of Vietnamese food, Vietnamese travel, adventure travel, like you said. Um, all of that is allowing Facebook to narrow down the audience. And then uh, how do, do you have any advice on creating a compelling um, advertisement? Do you point to a blog post? Do you point directly to your tours? What's your philosophy on what you show them? I, I point. Uh, I I never point to my blog posts. Um, I have sometimes boosted blog posts that you know that were being shared a lot, and I didn't find that that helped draw much traffic to your website. I think with a blog post, especially, there's just too much text 
and you know I write too much text and when when you're you're advertising the image should take precedent you know Facebook is very visual if you're overwhelming people with text then uh, then you might uh, you know um, lose their attention at that time so you should write as little text as you can but write a headline that's exciting mm -hmm. and um, and to, to hook people and to click onto the link what was what do you show them in terms of the ad then your typical I, I just show them pictures of the my my drivers you know the the girls taking guests on the back of the motorbike so um, usually I'll, I'll show like either um, women on the because a lot of women you know um, they're uh, solo travelers they they worry about going on these tours they think maybe it's not a the, the type of tour that accommodates that maybe like because we have female drivers that uh, men would only book this tour or so and I try to get people you know to to understand that our tours are designed for every everybody so i try to focus on some you know pictures that are family friendly that show little kids on tours so older guests on the tours are, are just uh, women on on the tours yeah okay and then you link directly to the, the booking a tour page or the information right. or, or my own tour. page okay right so, yeah so I'll, sometimes i'll link to if I'm making a, the headlines pretty general, like you know, EXO tours run the most acclaimed uh, food and city tours in uh, in Vietnam, then I'll I'll link straight to. But if I'm directly marketing my food tour, then I'll link directly to that. And just to clarify for folks, you mentioned at one point there, you can target by people that are traveling. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Is is that a sort of an option when? targeting people yes that's an option and I honestly I don't know much more than that I just see that as an option when you're creating the ad so uh, you know I always put it in there and uh, I'm not sure how much it would like Google uh, Facebook they have uh, something called Facebook pixel which is a little bit of code that you can insert into your website to track conversions and all that and you know to, to prove that you don't have to be that technical and all that stuff to follow I, I had my IT uh, you know my website guy put the code so we have Google uh, Facebook pixel on our website but I've never tracked it I don't know what our conversion rates and stuff are uh, if we get more bookings. I'm assuming the ads are working. <laughs> if I put out a blog post I'm sharing, and we get more bookings, I assume the blog post. But I, I honestly don't spend that time to go into the little nitty gritty detail to follow every single click and conversion. Yeah, I think, and, I'll, uh, and know, I'll echo that Facebook has made it a lot easier to track conversions. And it's same sort of thing. If you're using WordPress, you can get a plugin that is uh, essentially your you know your Facebook tracking code. So literally, if you can copy and paste. Um, and install a WordPress plugin, you can get that Facebook code on your page. And then, and then to get um, the information on a particular conversion, um, basically all you need to go in and is set up a, uh, a goal and say, hey, if they get to this payment confirmed, you know, or, or um, booking confirmed page, that counts as a conversion. And you can get some really great, great data, but we won't, we won't dive uh, too deep in there. I've heard from other tour companies that, um, there's a few ways that you can use lookalikes, but a great strategy that um, you could experiment with Tolman for anyone else listening is if you do have uh, a mailing list or even right. your customer data, these are all of the customers that have booked with us over the last couple of years. If you put that into um, a CSV file or essentially an Excel file, you can upload that to Facebook and essentially say, hey, these are my um, customers. And you can tell them, tell Facebook to make a lookalike audience based off of a list of emails that you've uploaded. Now, it's, it's not perfect just because um, it, Facebook will do its best to connect your list of emails and contact information with the Facebook net, network. So not, it's not as if you're going to have a perfect match of your existing previous customers then on Facebook. But it does a pretty good job. And then what you can do is create a lookalike audience and adjust your targeting. But more or less, um, you can then serve ads a lookalike audience of your exact customers, which is a pretty powerful way. And they've made it quite simple. So that's another uh, just recommendation for those of you interested in taking maybe a first couple steps into targeting with Facebook. I echo that point that Tom made. You don't need to spend a whole lot of money to see if this is uh, working. Oh, thanks for that tip. I think I've heard of uh, the look of, I, I just haven't followed up on it. So we've mentioned a little bit about SEO. You've talked about your um, Facebook strategy in terms of advertising. 
have there, have there been any other sort of keys to your success when, when growing, when you're thinking about promotion and marketing? I think, um, you know, I ask any entrepreneur, when you have a business, your brand, and uh, the way to build your brand is always be marketing. I think every little thing you do, from the way you answer emails, uh, from the way you train your, your guys, um, for instance, like on our tours, all our tour tour guys, they have their own separate business cards with our with our brand on it, with their contact details and stuff like that. And we tell people that if they need any assistance when they're getting on, that they can feel free to email or call us. And a lot of people at the end of the tour, they ask for extra business cards and they'll pass them out to other travelers on the tour. Like they'll say, you know, other people meet meet other travelers and people will ask them like what was one of the best things they did in Vietnam and they didn't mention our tours. They have extra business cards they can pass out to people. Um, and this is a small detail that a lot of people don't do. Um, I, I mentioned on Facebook before that we take pictures, free pictures, you know, digital photos are free. It, uh, it doesn't cost you anything. So, you know, there's no reason for you not in every, you know, every almost everybody has a smartphone. Just take out your smartphone, take pictures uh, for the guests, mail it to them. When you mail it to them, you can ask them for reviews, uh, you know, on on Google or uh, on Facebook or, or, or TripAdvisor. So that helped boost our reviews a lot when we did that from the very beginning. Um, we also offered a video option on our tours, which, uh, doesn't really make us any money, um, but uh, you know we have our staff follow the tours. We film uh, the entire tour, and then we cut down the video to about ten minutes. We add, you know, three pop songs to it, and make them really catchy, edit it, you know, a fun way, mm -hmm. and then we uh, mail them to the guests. The guests share it, you know, the videos on social media, on YouTube, and stuff like that. And also, when they get home, you know, they'll play it for their neighbors and stuff like that. So I can't, you know, I think this little stuff like that helps a lot over time and even though you can't measure the success of those marketing you know of, of, of those tools that uh, I, I think you know um, they, they they add up over time so just little details you know whatever you do whether you're the way you answer your phone or you, you answer email when we answer email we have a link to a blog on there that we write you know for if you need travel advice the best travel advisor tips you know click on this link, which, you know, drives more traffic to your blog. Um, so I, I, I just feel that if you're running a business and you, you want to be independent, you know, you don't have to work with partners and you don't have to go begging for business from hotels and tour companies that are an OTA. You mentioned experimenting with, with YouTube. Uh, another piece of advice I've, I've heard is for every blog post that you've got, um, answering a question you can absolutely make that into a YouTube video. And again, right. positioning yourself as an expert, as somebody who's uh, not just, sh not even at all for these videos, showcasing your tours per se, but you're answering that question um, in an in-depth way. And then of course, ending with some branding material. This is our brand, you know, you're linking back to your website in the YouTube description. Because very often, because Google is, um, owning YouTube, they're putting the video responses to questions quite high in those search results too. And a lot right. of people love video. So um, if you are, have a frequently asked questions where you give some great answers, we've got two uh, call to actions here. Tom says, turn them into blog posts, make them helpful, make them useful. Uh, and then two, make them into YouTube videos as well and have, make them you know as high quality as you can. Uh, but the idea is being helpful. And all of this is going to help with getting organic traffic. Love, love, love these suggestions. It's nice to speak with somebody who's built so much of it um, independently. I'd love for you to speak a little bit about training. Um, of course, I sing from the rooftops every day that you have to have an amazing tour, an amazing guest experience. As you're scaling up and as you grew and added more tour guides, how did you maintain quality? Well, I do something that a lot of people don't agree with, you know, I, we do use scripts and I've talked to, you know, some companies, they said, well, they don't want to use scripts because it comes off unnatural. But if you want to scale, and like I said, we scale from three staff to, you know, to over like 90 tour guides. Um, and how do you keep the quality? Not because the ability of every, you know, even though I love all our tour guides, um, their ability, you know, there's there's a huge range in ability. Some of, uh, have natural charisma, 
uh, some, not me, uh, but uh, some of them have natural charisma. Some of them have, you know, a natural love for history, and they know all about the city and history and stuff like that. And, and a lot of people, they, they don't. They have the passion, but they don't have the knowledge. So we have the scripts to balance the knowledge, at least for the stops that we go to on the tour. So the, I think the range and quality between our worst tour guide and our best is you no know, more than 20%. But if you didn't have scripts and, you know, you go to a place and somebody asks, you know, basic historical questions about this place or, you know, they or, or maybe their grammar, English, uh, you know, because my, my staff, they're all Vietnamese. They're all not native English speakers. Basically, if they follow the script, they memorize the script, it basically gives them a general uh, decent uh, grammar for that for the information in that area. Also, I said they get some basic knowledge for for each of the stops and how to handle uh, difficult uh, situations. Also, um, we also did training videos. You know, this is something we we did early on. Also, so for um, new staff in the past we would have you know the 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 new tour guides follow the old ones and learn from them and learn from the script but you know the scripts can't you can't fit every single thing in a script otherwise the, the script would be uh you know 100 pages long so video helps a lot so we went you know to have our videographer go on the tours and film you know um all the locations and you know we would have subtitles about what is unique about each of these locations and and then also just basic things like you know how to train people how to get on the bike safely things what they shouldn't do like you know like move their body shake their body back and forth and which could cause you know be dangerous for the driver to uh, maintain the balance um basic things like how to uh, you know how to cook certain dishes and stuff like that on the tour so you know having these videos and then allowing the which allowed you know the staff to watch them over and over and review things they you know they didn't catch the first time is extremely helpful that's so, wonderful like because training, we, we uh, help with uh, a lot of companies team training and i advise people to make videos on the exact things that you you've done so huge huge tips here for folks who are are listening recording your best guides in action it's like tom like you said you can record the best version of your tour and sometimes that might even be the tour owner you know if you founded the company and you give the best tour have somebody come right. and record that um, so that other people can study it still do all the great things that tom mentioned having them shadow a tour the other great thing i recommend is having those experienced tour leaders or your most senior guides shadow the new guides on their first tour so after yeah. they've followed a while you can reverse that and then they can provide some feedback on um, tips to improve things they may have forgotten um, but doing this and capturing it digitally is so key so now we've got some of these the a safety briefing no matter what type of tour there's usually a, some sort of safety component walking tours maybe not so much um, but you know if you're talking about hopping on a bicycle or a motorbike or um, whatever it might be if you've got a really fantastic safety video breaking that down um, uh, all of that is tremendous to have recordings because you never know when those experienced staff are going to leave is the other thing too. You might have somebody that's right. just like your have your top trainer and they, uh, who knows, get a new job, they start a family, something changes and you lose that, um, those superstars. And the more that you can uh, digitize that content, the more it can save you time um, year after year too, right? Because you can uh, prescribe right. that stuff. How did you approach uh, recruiting and, and finding the tour leaders? We uh, luckily, I found one of uh, one of my office staff. She was working HR at a HR company, so she quit that company, worked for us. So she was she's our main recruiter. And honestly, I don't know all the little tactics that she used, but she posts ads in a lot of uh, Facebook groups, you know, um, job groups. Um, she does a lot of online job boards and stuff like that, and um, and our Facebook page too. Uh, sometimes because we have so many Vietnamese people that follow us on the on the page, we advertise sometimes positions on there, which uh, helped uh, you know with application. And once you know, honestly, once you build a brand, once you're pretty well known, people will find you. You know, in the first few years, it was hard to find staff because nobody knew what who we were. We did they didn't know. You know, we didn't have a reputation. Um, you know, but once you develop a brand and reputation, and people are excited. You know, they they know you're famous. They they want to work for you, and they're proud to brag to people they work for you. So it's much much easier to hire once you actually have a, a decent uh, brand and reputation. 
Yeah, all great, all great advice. Look, you've been really generous with your time. Uh, just, I guess, as the the last uh, last thing, what what advice would you have for folks who are are really looking to to scale up their operations? You've given lots, but any other piece of advice for tour company uh, owners out there who want to get to the level where you're at with the success that you've had? I think the most important advice I could give anybody is once you can hand off your tour to a good uh, tour manager, tour leader, uh, to stop going on the tour. If you're an owner and you're still going on the tour after one, two years and stuff, you're wasting a lot of your time. Our business really didn't really take off until I stopped going on the tour and focused on training, to, you know, uh, optimizing your business, focusing on marketing. And you know, you as the owner know your business and what kind of market or customers you're targeting the most uh, and you understand um, what you have a vision for where your uh, your company's going to go so it should be you to that focus or, or that leads the marketing effort for your business uh, also you know if once you step back and you have time to look at your tours you can better see ways you can improve them like when I wanted to scale in the beginning, you know, we had a food tour that started from 5.30 to 10, and we would have issues with, like, you know, parking and the number of seats at restaurants and stuff like that. So when I filled up the first few years, when I filled up all the spots, like our maximum group size, I think, was 16, and once we filled up 16 people, I would reject all other, you know, bookings on that date. And we rejected, I think, in the first few years easily, you know, 20, 30,000 you know, people, that's a lot of not just lost revenue, but people that are going to your competitors. So you're making your competitors stronger by not taking as many guests as you can. Uh, so we, you know, I figured out later on that I could, you know, we would find, you know, I, I would spend time with other staff to find alternative restaurants, backup restaurants we could use. So we would take two, three different groups at 5.30. Then later on, I even figured out to stagger the times, which really helped us. So we would start some groups at 4.30 and some groups start at 6 p.m. So with, you know, all the multiple groups and the staggered times, we were able to take a lot, lot, lot more guests on uh, our tours than we did in the past. And uh, I think that if we would have done that much, much earlier, we would have grown, actually be much stronger than we are right now. Well, great advice. I often hear um, if you're working in your business, you know, you're not working on your business. And I think that right. uh, nicely summarizes what you're saying of, of stepping back so you can tackle these problems. It sounds like because that was going to follow up, but you answered it beautifully. Um, OK, so say I'm a tour business owner. I've, I've found an operations manager. I've got a good team of guides. I'm full back. Where would you recommend I spend my time now? So part of it I heard there was solve solve problems <laughs> as they come up, um, seize opportunities. Right. Uh, so obviously for you to expand double or even triple the number of guests you were bringing on, you need to do some creative thinking. Hey, how if we don't have space at this restaurant, that means approaching other restaurants. Um, if right. we uh, can't, that's the maximum capacity at this time. Hey, what if we came an hour and a half later or an hour and a half earlier? Any other advice for where they, these people should now spend their time now that we've freed up uh, parts of our day? <laughs> That's the problem is once you have too much free time, it gives you time to be complacent and lazy. So, you know, I, don't, I, th I think, you know, instead of trying to, I think sometimes people, I, you know, with me too, I stress out when I think about, you know, too much or be too ambitious at one time. So just break up your task, your marketing task, whether it's the SEO or blog post or stuff, into uh, you know, to smaller uh, segments so that you can just do a little bit every single day. If you just, you know, you say, okay, instead of spending, you know, 10 hours on this, you know, one day to try to do, you know, all this stuff for this marketing effort, why don't you just do, uh, you know, one hour or one and a half hours every day, and then uh, you know it's it will be less overwhelming and less stressful stressful for you that way. Um, if I think I, if I would have approached it right now, that's what I'm doing. I pretty much you know people are think you know I'm a workaholic because I'm on my computer all the time, but a lot of times I'm just kind of screwing around or you know watching Netflix or doing this stuff. But once I take a break, then I'll I'll I'll, I'll take on a task that I have planned and I write out, I organize all my tasks in order of what is most important to what's least, and I try to work on the most important stuff first, and then you know. And then until I'm done with uh, all the tasks, but uh, you're re really never done if you're an entrepreneur and you're working on your business. You t 
you really have to work on it every day. And, and, and like I said, you, you should be trying to market your business in some way every single day. If you do that, I, I don't see how you could possibly fail. Yeah, I like that, especially with those ranking your to-do list. I could relate so much to everything you just said there, too, of <laughs> even something like your inbox, even as a, an owner or operator, if you step back, suddenly you're in your inbox for you know half of the day or three quarters of the day sometimes, um, and you have just no time to work on the, those projects, those tasks, the, the most important ones, right? Which are maybe expanding your capacity, yeah. maybe building new um, subcontractors, these kinds of things. Yeah. I think with like, you know, for if you're a tour operator, you, one of the first staff that you should prioritize hiring is somebody that can answer and manage bookings, you know, because those things, I think if you have, unless you, you do all custom tours, if you have like a, a tour with an itinerary, it's not that difficult to, to have some kind of template that your staff can use to, to answer, you know, and mm-hmm. reply to most emails. And that's what we do. Uh, so I, I actually have very, spend very little time on email. Some, sometimes it's weeks or, you know, before I have to look at enemy email, it has to be something that's very, very difficult and uncommon that my staff has never dealt with, uh, before I really have to, uh, spend time, you know, on, on, on little things like that, which I think are menial things that, uh, you know, the owner shouldn't have to focus on. Sure. Do booking software can help uh, with that? In Vietnam, do you have good booking software options? Uh, no, <laughs> we don't. Uh, I've heard of, uh, you know, a lot. But, you know, one of the things that I did mention before is, that uh, you know, with uh, our success over time, you know, managing bookings that, you know, it can get really, really complicated, uh, you know, with uh, especially with us, we don't work with big single groups. We have um, we, we do what was the name for like uh, the free um, independent traveler? The yeah, fit? free 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 inter- fit travelers. Uh, so almost all our guests, like you know, ninety nine percent are fit travelers. Uh, sometimes we have big groups, you know, from universities or something book book with us, but it's, uh, it's rare. Um, so if you have a group of sixteen, for instance, like our food tour, the maximum group size, you could have maybe eight couples, or you could have you know three couples and a bunch of single travelers, and they all come from from different hotels. So you have to organize or you know plan the the different pickup times so everybody arrives around the same time, so nobody's sitting around waiting too much. You have to do with food restrictions. You have to deal with. Um, you know, payments like some guests have uh, paid deposit, some have paid in full, some have, you know, have a balance, you know, they still owe. Um, some book, like, you know, extra stuff like the video option. Um, you have tons of staff, some are full time, some are part time. I mean, how do you manage all those things, you know, without, especially if you're growing, if you're, you grow into a, a fairly uh, large business, you know, it's overwhelming. And if you're still using Excel and uh, Google Calendar, you're going to end up making a lot of mistakes when you're transferring information from one, you know, one app to the other. So you need some kind of integrated app that manages all your data and stuff like that. So with that, you know, the money that we made early on, we developed our own uh, booking app or booking software that manages, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, our business. Yeah, fantastic. And I think that speaks to being prepared to scale too. So being ready for that success. If you're spending uh, a little bit of your time or even most of your time every day building up your marketing, that's going to create other challenges for you, which is, uh, yeah, a, a whole lot of new customers. So I think uh, that's good advice to be ready to, to scale uh, as you go. And those are good problems to be solving, right? If you're uh, trying to figure out how you can manage your, your volume and all the people that want to give you their money and come and experience your tour. Uh, these right. are good problems, right? Yeah, and I, I can't complain too much about it. <laughs> yeah, well, we we have a right to complain always. Look, uh, thank you so much, Tom. It was a real pleasure connecting and uh, hopefully um, People can forgive us the internet connection. We're going many, many miles across many oceans and seas. But uh, thank you for taking the time to connect today, Tom. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, If you're ever back in, like I said, you've been in Vietnam, I think you were here four years ago. But if you're ever back, uh, feel free to drop by and uh, um, I'll show you our setup over here. Hey, I'd love to. Anyone else? uh, That offer, I'm sure, extends xotours.vn. Check them out. Uh, Obviously, they've had a great deal of success, and if you're in the area, uh, it sounds like a great little tour to hop on. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you.